Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Niche Pursuits News, and it's going to be a good one, I think. We have so many news stories to cover, and I know in the past, if you listen in previous episodes, I usually say, man, there's like 10 or 12 news items, and we only have time for three or four. Well, today we're going to try something different. We're going to try and actually touch on every single news story, um, and so you're going to hear everything that's on our list. Uh, we're going to dive deep on maybe three of them or so, but we're going to let you know everything that's at least on our, our list. So listeners, you can hear all the headlines and, and we're going to see how that goes. Uh, what do you think, Jared? Good idea. Rolling back the curtain on our agenda. We talk about this agenda doc that we put together. You're yes. just getting tired of all the work we put into it. And then we only t cover three of the stories, huh? That is true because <laughs> we read all the news stories, whether or not we, we cover them. So we might as well at least mention them. So. Get a little credit for all this work we're doing, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Pat our own backs a little bit uh, would always be good. And um, so after we cover the news stories, which we're going to try and get through uh, as quick as possible while still you know, diving deep on a few, we're going to cover our uh, side hustle projects, things we're working on the side. Uh, and then we're going to bring it home with a couple of weird niche sites and uh, we do have a couple of good ones. Uh, both of our sites actually get, you know, some organic traffic, and we'll share some of the stats there, but get uh, even more direct traffic. So these are sites that people apparently love and enjoy and go to directly time and time again, getting lots of traffic. So stay around for that if you want to know how to, to build a site that gets direct traffic. And not to tease it, but I know one of our sites, yours, uh, there's a lot of talk about direct traffic correlating with HCU gains versus reversal uh, versus, uh, down mm. downturns. And so we'll have some interesting topics to cover there. I think. Yes, we will. Yes, we <laughs> will. So I, I like the way you tease that because that's yeah. the whole point is, you exactly. know, we got to lock these people in, you know, hook stick them in around. the first minute or so stick around. So it's like a good YouTube with that, video. That's right. Uh, with that, let's jump into the news. Um, before we jump into the podcast, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. This is how we landed massive links for our client in The Sun, a DR90 website, and many other UK news websites. We have used freely available data from YouGov to simply find out what the nation's favorite car brand is and which brands people love the most. Of course, Rolls-Royce came out on top, Aston Martin second and Jaguar third. We put these insights in a short email and sent it to journalists that write about cars and to national news desks on behalf of our client. Within a few days, our client got featured in all the suns as well as many regional newspaper sites in the UK, gaining DR90 links to their leasing comparison website. YouGov website is full of unlimited PR stories with data already available for free. All you have to do is to start researching their data and start asking the data questions. You will be surprised of the unlimited PR campaigns that you will find there that can help you build massive exposure and links to your or your client's websites. I hope this video is helpful and inspirational. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now. The, the biggest story, and uh, I'll go ahead and share um, the article. It, it's related to a couple of things that we're going to talk about, but basically uh, there, was, there was some issues with Google Gemini. Uh, the Google Ge Gemini uh, image generation, right, is, is one of their... Uh, tools as part of Gemini. And this article that I'm showing on Forbes is just that, hey, Google's Gemini headaches spur $90 billion sell-off. And so if you look at um, the current stock price, that's basically what this article talks about. Um, you know, Google stock price over the last five days is down 6%. It's down even further today. Uh, all stemming from this issue with Google Gemini image generation. And so Google themselves actually came out with this official apology and said, hey, we recently made the decision to pause Gemini's image generation of people while we work on improving the accuracy of the responses. Now, this is one that we could talk about 
a lot and spend a lot of time on and show examples. There's a lot out there. If you go to Twitter or probably Reddit or other places, you can see a lot of the examples that people were um, you know, coming up with with Google Gemini. Now, uh, at the core of the problem is that a lot of the, uh, the race of the people that uh, were being generated was not accurate, historically accurate right? That Google Gemini was not generating historically accurate races for people that were being generated. And it might not be the way that, you know, people might think. Um, so for example, if someone were to ask Google Gemini to generate an image of a king of England in the 1400s, you know, Google Gemini was coming back with a black person. Uh, and there's lots of other situations where instead of what might you historically should be a Caucasian person, right? People living in England in that time or Scotland, it was coming back with black people. Uh, and so uh, there was tons of examples of this just, uh, and, and it got the attention of Google and they shut it down. So I'm trying to tread lightly here because, you know, this is a subject that certainly sparked a lot of commentary on all sides. Uh, but it was enough that Google shut it down and they're going back trying to fix it. So, Jared, what do you have to say about all this? Well, the big story, which this isn't the first time we've had this story uh, in terms of the larger perspective, uh, but it's it's one that really, you know, hit a sensitive part of the subject or the storyline. This idea that, you know, uh, Google, uh, not Google, sorry, uh, AI is known to hallucinate. And um, uh, I think this one brings into question, perhaps for the first time in a real public way, like, are those hallucinations or inaccuracies at s in some way influenced by the company that produces or makes the large language model that you're using? And I'm not saying that, or insinuating they are, just saying that I think that's a lot of the undertones here is we know that AI, ChatGPT, for example, will hallucinate and make stuff up, but we have never had any reason to believe that there's actual agenda behind that from the corporation creating it. Right. Exactly. And that, that is definitely at the core of the issue here is that, uh, right, did, did the programmers somehow put some sort of um, coding in place to make sure that they, you know, represented certain groups more or less than others? Uh, and uh, so that, yeah, that's sort of the crux of the, the issue here. And, I mean, I, I also uh, think, you know, we look at a lot of issues uh, with generative AI, with SEO, with Google, and we, we, we all kind of admit like, hey, we're really involved, right? Like this is our, our world, but this certainly impacted the broader world of Google. Like this, that you're, the stock hit, uh, the stock price that you're talking about, the fact that they pulled it back, the fact that this is causing all sorts of controversy for Alphabet as a parent company um, uh, is, is, is really, really interesting in terms of the crossroads we're at for them and the crossroads we're at for the future of, of AI as an interactive uh, model for these big companies. Right. It, I mean, it's such like a hot button topic, right? You've got AI that's just controversial in and of itself. People Period. don't know what the future is going to look like with AI. Uh, but then if you've got a corporation that is somehow tweaking results, right, uh, it's it's a bad look for Google because not just the AI is does Google have an agenda behind their search results, their core product, right? Are they favoring certain sorts of things that maybe shouldn't be favored, right? Uh, and so that is what's really hitting hard on Google. And if you so if, if you do a, a search, if you look up, you know, Google stock price, all the news articles are about this Google Gemini, the AI, the the agenda that Google has. And so they're they're getting a lot of backlash uh, for that right now. So and uh, one person giving a lot of that backlash right now is uh, Elon Musk. Um, Elon Musk is going to war with Google. And this is one that I won't dive in deep, maybe give a 30 second overview here because it stems from this Google Gemini issue. Uh, Elon Musk has been very vocal about it. And uh, of course, talking about Grok, his, this is the perfect time for him to talk about his AI chatbot, chatbot Grok and how much better it is. Uh, and so Elon Musk is hitting Google very hard on Twitter, pointing out all the faults uh, with Google, not just their AI image generation, but search and and the the whole company, right? Uh, and of course, it's a perfect marketing opportunity for Elon Musk and his own AI chatbot. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously he has an agenda to to exercise yes. when it comes to this. And yet, obviously, he was at the center, if you want to read the article, of many of the comparisons that were happening. <laughs> uh, of, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so to some degree, I'm like, dude, you got an agenda. So I don't really. But at the same time, like he was literally targeted with a lot of the screenshots and examples of against Gemini. So perhaps he can at least be given some license to respond to that. <laughs> right. I agree. Just, you know. Broad strokes. It, it didn't look like Google Gemini liked Elon no, Musk didn't. very much. No, it, it looked like, yeah. Like that, he's that's a low, low human being, right? <laughs> very uh, <so> low. <laughs> people can read up on that because there's like some direct comparisons between, you know, certain people. Actually, here's the paragraph. I'll highlight it. I'm not going to read it. But if people, you know, uh, anyways, Google Gemini, not very nice to Elon Musk. And so that's another reason that they, they pulled uh, Gemini back as well. So, uh, Let's go on to the next one here. Uh, in adweek.com, I thought this is just a really fascinating story myself. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so Google is paying publishers to test an unreleased Gen AI platform. So in exchange for a five-figure sum per year, it's a, it's a per year sum, so not a, necessarily a ton of money, uh, publishers must use the tool to publish three stories a day. and. Um, I don't know if it gave the actual uh, platform. Like, is it, I, th I think it's just totally it's private, weird. nothing that we can check out, uh, right? Like, I, I, I believe that. Yeah, they made reference to the Google News. Uh, I think it's the Google News Index. Is that what they call it? GNI? Oh, I believe so. Yeah, Google okay. News Initiative. So it's part of their Google News Initiative. I don't think they oh, stipulated okay. where it had to be published, though. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so uh, part of the Google News initiative, right? There's there's this apparently AI uh tool that is private for, you know, call it beta testers, early users here where uh yeah, it, basically what I said, they need for for a period of 12 months, they need to produce a fixed volume of content, three articles a day or more. Uh and uh it's going to be free, you know, to the publishers using this tool. It's basically, like I said, I think it's a beta test. Hey, come in, try out this tool, publish the content, and we're gonna pay you to actually use this tool. And now, of course, it's very interesting on, like you said, many levels. One is, yeah, you know, Google's got this Gen AI tool that they're paying publishers, right? But two, that sort of harkens to the question like, well, what does Google think about AI content in the SERPs and on websites? Well, apparently they're quite friendly to it, um, is my thought. So what do you think? Well, for starters, the program does, a uh, human editor will have to scan the copy for accuracy before publishing three stories per day. The program does not require that these AI-assisted articles be labeled as AI-assisted. Ah, yes. Okay, so that's one thing. So it's like, do as I say, but not as I do, right? Um, and then, I mean, I think this is a much bigger story when you take a step back. Uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Again, I, I don't want to say out of turn here, but in effect, it's AI that's creating these articles from other, mm -hmm. from, from other sources, right? That's where AI yes. gets its articles. That's where AI gets its information to write an article is from other sources. So in essence, Google is publicly funding, ripping off other journalists' work. Mm-hmm. Okay. Exactly. I, yeah. Yeah. Just repeating what I'm reading, basically. That's what really is happening here, right? As I understand it, uh, the users have to like provide a source, like uh, some sort of data source. It sounds like uh, they they uh, I I don't know exactly how it works, but somehow you select, hey, I want these five or ten sources, websites, news publications, right? And then when they hit on a topic that you cover, right? So if you're covering uh, marathon running and any new source comes in on those uh, subjects, the, you, the Gen AI tool will then generate new articles based on the previously written content. Yes, that's exactly what it sounds like to me. I mean, I feel like they must know something we don't know about this antitrust lawsuit because it doesn't seem like they'd be doing things like this if there is yeah. ambiguity about the outcome of that, 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 that lawsuit. That just seems to fly in the face of that. Yeah, good, uh, good point. Um, so it, this, this is one that, uh, is, um, I was going to say less interesting because of the tool itself, because I don't know if any of us will ever get access to the tool itself, right. but more just interesting, uh, 
because it reveals a lot about the attitude of Google uh, as far as it relates to AI content. So 100% agree. Yeah. So uh, our next story, continuing to move quick here, is uh, the vice.com has uh, shared the CEO, Bruce Dixon, announced recently that there will be hundreds of layoffs and that the the company will no longer publish on vice.com. Uh, and uh, so it, it's like another story of a, a big publisher that is laying off hundreds of authors. Um, you have to think a lot of that is because of artificial intelligence or um, other reasons that they're not getting as much traffic perhaps from Google. And there is some evidence, I think, behind it being partially related to not getting traffic from Google uh, because they say that uh, instead they're going to turn themselves into a, what did they call themselves, a studio publisher uh, that, yeah, transition to uh, a studio model. Here, let me just read the sentence. Moving forward, we will look to partner with established media companies to distribute our digital content, uh, including news, on their global platforms as we fully transition to a studio model. As part of this shift, we will no longer publish content on vice.com, instead putting more emphasis on our social channels as we accelerate our discussions with partners to take our content to where it will be viewed more broadly. And so just fascinating. They're no longer going to publish content on vice.com. They're basically giving up on their own website, um, but they're going to uh, be very active on social media. They're going to build up their social media brands and they're going to publish content uh, in a studio model on partner websites. And so I don't know exactly how that works exactly, but uh, the fact that they're going to try and uh, get traffic to their content from social media and build that up is just fascinating. So which of our SEO friends is gonna land vice.com as an mm -hmm. paint in a GoDaddy <laughs> auction? That's right, how long will it be before the <laughs> domain itself uh, disappears? And that was sort of um, the secondary story to this was related to that, that a lot of the journalists yeah. and authors that are getting fired, they're trying to create a, a backlog of all the content they've written because they're worried that, hey, this website's going to go away. They're going to delete all the content. Although that wasn't explicitly said, they didn't say, hey, the website itself is going away. They just said, we're not going to publish new content. But uh, the next logical step It's happened step in the past. Be, yeah, mm -hmm. they referenced some sites where it's happened in the past. And again, uh, frequently crawled websites that are large like that should end up in, you know, most of the content will end up in archive.org. But still, it's it's a point worth bringing up, you know? Yeah. I mean, do you think this is AI related? They, they, they're, they don't want their content crawled for AI and this is a different way of handling it. I mean, you said the only thing that would go against that maybe is that you said that they are still publishing on partner websites. So it still would, I don't know. I'm just kind of, it's, it's a bit of a bizarre uh, angle to take on this entire, you know, debacle we have in front of us. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a little bit vague exactly what is going to be going on. Um, yeah. And so I, I'm just trying to reread his sentence here, uh, trying to read between the lines exactly what kind of content they're going to be publishing. Um, we don't know for sure. So that's one we'll just keep our eye on and kind of share additional uh, thoughts going forward. But uh, I, I think it's interesting because they're clearly looking for different traffic strategies or uh, audience building strategies uh, from what they were doing in the past. So, okay. So another uh, story that we're going to cover here today is, um, and, and this particular sort of news release uh, was shared, uh, Chrome is getting three new generative AI features. They, uh, Chrome, um, Google announced this, uh, Chrome announced this back in January. However, they finally re started releasing some of these features. So that's why it's news um, today in particular. Well, all, the three features uh, one, smartly organize your tabs. Apparently, ha pe people have a thing where they have like hundreds of tabs open, right? And this will help What's organize that? them and suggest different tabs to make it easier, I guess. Are you more of a uh, – yeah, I can imagine. You you probably have four or five maximum tabs at any one time. I can, I, I, yeah, I am. I, yeah. I usually close them all up. That's the yeah, way there I There you go. go. So, I've seen some screenshots online of people who have hundreds, but yeah. 
Yeah, unless I'm running a a, a podcast. Yeah, like here now. today is got like is two dozen tabs open. Yeah. Um, the next one: create your own themes with AI. So just change the look and feel of of Chrome. You know, that's kind of cool. Uh, and then uh, the next one, which is a little bit bigger, I think, is get help drafting things on the web. So now you will have the ability if you're leaving a review, you can use the help me write option. And it will read the content of the web page that you're on and the context, and it will help and I, you know, suggest content for that review. And then, of course, you then uh, edit and change uh, and can, um, yeah, m make sure it's a good review yourself. Uh, Glenn Gabe on Twitter gave a couple of screenshots. So when you're setting it up, right, you have the ability now to turn on these experimental features in Chrome. So if you're a Chrome user, you can go over right now, you know, and click on the experimental AI option and uh, turn on things like the help me write um, the, the toggle there. And uh, then I believe he gave a couple of other options here. Yeah, just um, the ability to actually write. And uh, there you go. It will it will give you the option for tone um, to yeah different style perhaps that you want, but uh, just fascinating because it's bringing essentially like an open AI ge you know Gemini uh, tool to everyone for free directly in Chrome that can help them write content essentially on any web page. Uh, it's I I could see it being incredibly helpful. Um, I could see it also. Uh, over time, like everything changing the way that we, we, we do and we read and we evaluate, you know, like just even that screenshot you just had as an example, I believe from Glenn Gaber he's given a restaurant review and he said, great atmosphere, great food, great atmosphere. And then the AI, the generative AI goes on to say the restaurant has a nice, warm and inviting atmosphere. Well, those are adjectives that are made up. They, they really are now. Uh, I, as a press photographer, I could say, well, what if it was more of a cool modern environment that could still be a great atmosphere, but warm and inviting and cool and modern are different things. And anyway, so I could just, yep. you know, my mind starts going and going where this could end up. And I don't know if that's an accurate review. I get it. The food is great and the atmosphere is great, but the nuance might get lost along the way. Are you suggesting that the first model that they put out could, could get some things wrong? If, if history were any indicator. <laughs> <laughs> if we look at Google stock price today, yes, uh, we can understand there could be Let issues. people decide on that. Yeah. I, um, I, don't, I don't think uh, you'd, you'd call me crazy for suggesting these things at this point. So I would not. Uh, okay. Uh, here's another uh, quicker hit story here. OpenAI says New York Times hacked chat GPT to build its copyright lawsuit. And of course, we covered this, this story um, that um, the New York Times is suing OpenAI for revealing the content behind their paywall, basically, that OpenAI was able to access the paywalled content and use that to train their models. Uh, and now OpenAI is arguing that, hey, the New York Times kind of hacked the system, they had unethical prompts, uh, things that went against their guidelines. They shouldn't have done that. And that's the only reason OpenAI spit out the responses that, that they had. I I find it kind of silly. It's like, hey, they, they use prompts, it sounds like anybody else. Uh, and you know, they they convinced OpenAI to reveal things it shouldn't reveal. So it's kind of like how the it's kind of like buying a fast car and then suing the company because uh it it went so fast that you you hit something quickly. You know, I mean, uh, it, it's weird. I mean, it is weird that um, a company would hire someone to kind of create this scenario. And I'm not a legal expert, but it's also, uh, you know, it's the system that they were given access to and stuff. It is, I, I guess maybe from a broader perspective, Spencer, I've never really paid much attention to the terms of service I have when I'm chatting mm. with OpenAI, with ChatGPT, you know. So I guess... Maybe I should pay closer attention to the terms of service around that. I, I don't think people realize that. Like, there's terms of service around what you are supposed to chat about. I think that's interesting. You kind of think of it like having coffee with a friend. You can just talk to it about anything. Mm. Well, there you go. So they broke their terms of service, perhaps. Uh, 
again, that one's a quick hit. So we're going to, we're going to do our best move on. This one's also going to be a quick hit. I would just encourage people to go over to yeah. you know, gsqi.com. Um, and, uh, five ways that Google's helpful content system could evolve based on the evolution of previous punitive algorithm updates like Panda and Penguin. And so Glenn Gabe, you know, does a great job breaking down, like here's kind of the five bullet points of what could happen with the Google helpful content update. Um, it, it, it's interesting. Um, he kind of speculates, Hey, it could lessen, it could lessen the severity. It could no longer be site-wide. Uh, you know, it could just hit certain pages heavier. Uh, or nothing could change. So it's it's an interesting read, but uh, not truly news in terms of like we don't know for sure. It's a lot of uh, speculation. At this well, point. I think it's but interesting. Worth a read. Yeah, we've likened HCU to Panda and Penguin many times on this podcast, right? In terms of, I'd say that and the medic update are the only other updates in Google's history that have been so you know uh, wide reaching. I guess I don't know. You could come with a lot of words to describe yeah. it, but. Um, you know, and a lot of people, this is kind of their first massive update. So it's kind of cool to watch how Glenn connects the dots with Penguin and Panda as those were insanely crazy updates and they happened, but they've, they've, they've gotten blended into how we do search now and how we optimize for the web. And so it's, yeah, I thought it was a fascinating read. And I, if you're looking for hope or encouragement from the HCU, this is probably one of the more encouraging pieces, although totally perspective, um, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, speculative. Uh, speculative. Thank you. One of those spec words. Totally speculative in nature, but still. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of data worth a read uh, for people curious about that. Um, the next one, another uh, friend of the show here, uh, Cyrus Shepard over at uh, zippy.com. And he came out with this uh, it was a little over a week ago. Um, we didn't have time last week to cover it, uh, but it is it's a fascinating. It was on the list last week to cover uh, winning and losing big Google updates, 50 site case study. Okay. And uh, yeah, the sub headline is a good one. What on page factors are associated with sites that see big gains or declines after Google updates? Turns out it's not author boxes. Uh, and so he talks about the helpful content update um, and uh, primarily. And uh this graphic is is excellent. It kind of gives you yeah. the core of everything that he's talking about. On-page website features versus Google updates. So basically, a lot of these have either a positive or negative correlation uh, with websites um, either increasing or decreasing in uh, the ranks, right? And so they looked at uh, 50 websites that either lost or gained significant organic traffic across Google updates between August and December of 2023. Of course, the helpful content update was in September. Uh, and so sites saw a traffic change of negative, negative 67% or an increase up to 5,500%, right? Uh, and so some of the big positive correlations, some mm -hmm. of the biggest... Um, Sites, sites that saw that sort of the biggest wins were ones that used some of these. I'll, I'll read maybe the top five or six here. Um, first person pronouns like I, I or we mm -hmm, in, Sorry. in your reviews. <laughs> Go ahead, Spencer. Sorry. No, that's all right. Uh, and or or using firsthand experience, which, of course, is very much coupled with the first one there. Um, are you actually reviewing the product? Having a cookie consent on the page having a uh, contact form or con ability to contact in the fo footer, having any way to contact the website owner, uh, you know, is another great positive correlator, right? Uh, and then you can read through all of these. There's a lot about ads, word counts, some of which, you know, are, don't have much of a correlation. Um, but things like, Having a foot, fixed footer ad has a strong negative correlation or fixed video ads or using stock images has a strong negative correlation. Uh, the number of ads, uh, notifications, a big me mega menu in the header, right? And so there's a lot of these things that I would encourage people to go through and look at these, all of these factors, because these are things that a lot of them you could definitely change and um, could maybe not fully recover if you're hit by the helpful content update, 
uh, but might help you recover from other updates or uh, prevent you from getting hit from future updates. It's, it's really a great study. Everything we've been doing to, for the most part <clears throat> up until now has been very, uh, uh, you know, uh, looking at sites and drawing analogies and conclusions. This is a very, it's not a causation study, right? So it's not like this led to this, but it's a correlation study. And um, if you look at that graphic, actually, uh, and I just want to, because I've had several people e email me or message me about it. Um, if you look at that graphic, um, basically the stuff at the top in the dark, dark green, that's the stuff that's highly correlation, highly corollary on a positive level, meaning if you have this, it's highly corollary. And then the stuff at the very bottom that's highly corollary on a negative level, meaning if you have this, it's very bad. Uh, is the dark red there. And basically, as you look at this graph, like pay attention to the stuff at the top and the bottom. The stuff in the middle yeah. is not as core. That's still very interesting, but it doesn't have a real strong trend one way or the other. But um, like you said, I mean, there's some things that are literally presses of buttons with your ad platform to remove a, a certain type of ad unit that Cyrus found strongly correlated with a negative impact in these recent updates. Um, uh, yeah. Certainly... We can all write in a different um, uh, pronoun per, uh, per se as we write our articles. For many, that's just a semantical choice. They just prefer to use a uh, certain you know, perspective when they share. So there's some really interesting things here that aren't um, – I think a lot of the information has felt very overwhelming, but this felt, feels very digestible and much of it's very approachable. I agree. I love it because it's something – yeah, you can – do I have a table of contents? I can check that box. All of these things are – you can check the box or uncheck the box, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can just do them. Yeah. Uh, and so some of it might be, you know, take take a little bit more in depth, right? About first Correct. person, first hand experience. You'd have to actually rewrite your content uh, to do that. But a lot of these are, yeah, simple fixes really. Mm. So uh, stock images great, one. Great list. Oh uh, yeah. Look at that. Yeah, strong <laughs> negative correlation. I was actually, as the resident photographer of the group, I was actually surprised to see it as strongly correlated negative to, yeah. uh, negatively. That's, uh, I think that's interesting. Yeah, super fascinating. And that could be a big job if you've got, you know, thousands of stock images that's, that you need to go swap out. That's not a press of a button one that we were talking about. No, no, it isn't. Okay, uh, the final story that I'm going to cover Oof. here, and uh, just briefly, this is one that you found. Um, maybe I'll let you chat about it briefly, but uh, Chrome Engine developers, uh, Chrome Engine devs experiment with automatic browser micropayments. Uh, so as I understand it, basically they're trying to develop a way in Chromium where users or browsers would actually pay website owners or publishers a very, very minuscule micropayment when they visited their website or browsed their content. Um, potential future way to monetize the web. Um, as I understand it, this is still very forward looking, experimental. Will it ever come? You know, we don't know. There's been problems with this in the past. And I have lots of questions about um, who's actually paying for it. Is it actually the browser, right? The individual? And why would they do that? Um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I'll just read a quote on it so we don't belabor it. You're right. It's incredibly, um, you know, uh, future-minded thinking. There's no real, uh, from this article at least, I couldn't find any real data to suggest this is actually happening. But, um, you know, a quote to read out. It, it quote, it provides a way for content creators and website owners to be compensated for their work without relying solely on ads or subscriptions. Um, notably, WM, web monetization, this idea, uh, offers two unique features, small payments and no user interaction that address several important scenarios unmet on the web. So uh, yeah, so many questions, right? Way more questions than answers here. But I mean, we're all talking about like, I, I got to reduce the ad density. Well, there goes some of my money. Oh, I can't have as many affiliate links because that's a, a bad for the HC. There goes some of my money there. And so, you know, it's nice to kind of see like, hey, at some point people are going to stop publishing content if it's not monetizable in some way, shape or form. Right. Uh, we have all these stories of big, big publishers that are feeling it way more than the rest of us. And so here's a story about maybe how the web works in the future that gives the experience that somebody like a Google wants while still monetizing and compensating mm -hmm. the, the publisher. I don't, you know, obviously very, very perspective. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's a, it's a emerging technology that uh, maybe will become something in the future, you know, a couple of years from now, a few, 10 years from now, who knows, or maybe never, but it is interesting. I mean, it is, uh, 
uh, kind of fascinating technology that they're building in. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens there. It, so, it reminds me of like, you know, when you can round up, you know, and have it go to savings, you know, they have these little like apps that like will yeah. round up purchases and send the money to savings and stuff. It just, I don't know why I thought of that, but it, you know, we've yeah. seen this sort of thing work in other areas, like from a very disconnected, I'm trying to draw analogies that are very loosely connected, but you know, I don't know. The micropayment yeah. thing has been around for a while. So I, I suppose we have that going for us. Yep. Hey everyone, Spencer here, founder of the Niche Pursuits podcast. Last year, the traffic to nichepursuits.com more than tripled with most of those gains coming from Google. In fact, I finally hit the 1 million page views per month milestone. In order to achieve this growth, my team and I publish over 100 articles a month. The final step for each of those articles, we build at least one new internal link to that article using Link Whisper. This helps index it faster and helps it rank better in Google. This also helps us avoid having any orphaned posts in the future. If you wanna give your new articles the best chance possible, you need to build a process around internal linking when you publish. It only takes a few seconds with Link Whisper to get suggestions and check the box next to the internal links you want. They are all built automatically once you've made your selections. No need to go into each article, find a relevant sentence, highlight the anchor text, and add the internal link. Link Whisper does all this automatically once you've made your selection. If you want to try out Link Whisper, just head over to linkwhisper.com and use coupon code podcast at checkout in order to get $15 off. Okay, well, we got through the news. We okay, got that was a lot of things there. Yeah, if, um, you know. uh, if you're if you're listening, if you're watching on YouTube, let us know what you think of. You know, I don't know what did we cover. Probably nine or ten stories there. We deep dove three of them, but we we did cover a lot. Yeah, yeah, I've got at least ten tabs uh, open here. Uh, so uh, good stuff, though. So we are going to move over to our shiny object shenanigans now, uh, and I'm going to talk about the same thing that I talked about last week. Um, it's something that I've been working on for a long time and it finally is happening. And in fact, I'm going to be launching the niche pursuits community on Monday. So just a couple of days after this episode comes out, uh, the niche pursuits community will be live. And so people can go to community.nichepursuits.com. And, uh, I thought it would be interesting to maybe just share a little bit more about what is going to be in the community. What's that all about? Uh, and so I'll just um, actually share a draft of what the new community page will look like. Right now, if you go to the home page, it does not look like this. Uh, but basically, I'm building a community because, you know, building an online business can be lonely, right? You're doing this all by yourself. Uh, but what if you had a community there to help you motivate you, to keep you accountable, and to help you actually grow your business with unique strategies. And so I'm building a community where that's exactly what's happening. So one is uh, a few of the things that will be offered. There are weekly calls with experts. So uh, early on, we're going to tackle the topic of Google Discover, right? So I'll bring on a couple of experts on the topic of Google Discover. And they're going to share what they're doing. And uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask them questions live on the call. Uh, and then second, there's going to be small mastermind groups where I combine you with three or four people that are maybe in a similar stage of business or a similar business model. And you can dive deep into whatever problems that you have and get your questions answered again um, within your small mastermind group on a deeper level because you're going to just talk about your business and their business. Uh, and then uh, there's going to be a private Discord channel. And I've already let in some founding members. And so there's a group of uh, some of us there that were already chatting on Discord. You're going to get real-time feedback. So if you want, you know, you have a question today that you need answered, you can ask that. People can answer. Um, I'll be in there along with my team asking uh, and answering some of those questions. And then perhaps uh, the final thing I'll share and perhaps my favorite is these ongoing challenges. Uh, so this is, gives you the ability to come in as a group and every couple of months or every month, uh, we will have a different challenge. So we might say, hey, for the next 60 days, we're gonna see who can get the most traffic from Pinterest. And that's all we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on Pinterest and we're gonna bring on a couple of experts to share their strategies, You know, give the sort of secret nuggets of how to grow Pinterest traffic 
And then at the end of 60 days, I'll give a monetary prize to the winner. Now, even the losers, if they don't, you know, get the most Pinterest traffic, hopefully they come out having learned something. They're actually getting more traffic from Pinterest and uh, they're a little bit more motivated in their business. Right. And uh, so that's, you know, there's a couple of other things that are involved in the community, but that's kind of uh, it in a nutshell. I'm super excited to be launching this on Monday um, to get the ball rolling and really build what I hope is the best community out there for niche publishers, bloggers, and online business owners. It's just the uh, full evolution of niche pursuits as a brand for you. And I, I don't want to go too far back, but <clears throat> it was many years ago. I don't know when, when you, I mean, there were many years where niche pursuits wasn't your like focus, right? It was kind of your side blog. And then certainly yep. the past couple of years, I remember you talking somewhere about how you realized like, this is really a valuable website and brand and I'm going to put more into it. Right. And it's, it's grown. You started putting it, giving it, you know, um, giving it uh, more of your emphasis and your time and, and, uh, and then building out the brand. And what do we talk a lot about when you're building out brand more than a website, like the, it kind of penultimate is, is establishing a community, right? And so it just feels like the the full circle of what Niche Pursuits has talked about for so many years. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, it's the Niche Niche Pursuits has a community, uh, you know, uh, a Facebook, private, uh, Facebook YouTube, group. There's here. like 40,000 people, YouTube, Twitter. There is a community there. And uh, I've often heard that people want more. They want to connect on a deeper level. And, um, you know, just by being in the industry for so long, I have so many connections and the ability to bring a lot of people in this industry together. And, uh, that is exactly what this niche pursuits community is going to be. So I, uh, I caught up with an old friend in, in our industry yesterday. We talked on the phone for an hour. We haven't talked in a couple of years. I believe we couldn't figure out the last time we talked. He he did he did say he's like ah oh, but I've been I've been hearing your voice because I've been listening to the the niche pursuits podcast uh, for uh, like frequently since then. You want to know what he said? His favorite uh, thing that he's uh, that niche pursuits has been doing. The one thing he decided to kind of point out. I have no idea what's that. He loved the AI challenge. Oh really? <laughs> Absolutely loved watching it, seeing what was working, seeing the uh, all the different types of websites that ended up you know kind of succeeding and stuff. So. You know, cool. it's exciting to see the challenges are going to be a pretty integrated part of this uh, this group. Yeah, that's always just been core to the brand as well, right? So with starting with my niche site projects, I've done four of them publicly. Now with the AI challenge uh, that's going on with a little tease that there will be a new YouTube video on Monday uh, as well coming out about uh, the AI challenge and update on the AI challenge. Mm -hmm. so let's move on. You know, we got to cover our weird niche sites here in a second. And so I want to give you time to talk about your side hustle uh, as well. So let's do that. Yours is going far better than mine. I brought it on myself by talking about uh, how I was I was due for a dud. So, okay, um, I, I'm being a little facetious, but um, I, I, I said a couple weeks ago that I was monetized on my weekend growth YouTube channel. And I was really curious, you know, I, I, we knew going in, this was never going to be a huge moneymaker with a number of views of this brand new, less than one year old uh, YouTube account that I publish one video a month to, you know, it's never going to be uh, life changing kind of money, but um, I wanted to see what it would look like. So first started, I have some, some news now, some, some numbers to report. We got the first couple weeks of data in here. So the first earnings started on February 12th. It was a Monday, two plus, a little over two weeks ago um, at time of recording. And uh, it was only like five cents that day. But you were quick to point out, ah, you know, it takes a little while for this stuff to build up, you know. Well, it's been monetized for just over two weeks. And I have earned in total $11.14. $11.14 in two weeks. So if you're doing the Solid. math at home, that's 74 cents a day. Hey, hey. <laughs> All right. What can, what can you buy for 74 cents? Well, I was thinking about that. If I, every two days I can buy a donut at my neighborhood donut. Okay. Stand. Hey, so free donut. And you know, I, like it. I do. It is a Saturday morning tradition that the Bauman family does go to get donuts from our neighborhood donut store. Ooh. So I think at my present earnings, I can buy the family donuts every week with my YouTube earnings. I, I, I so yes, that is where I'm, I'm going with this. Well, before you know it, you'll be able to invite a guest. And then you'll be able to get, you know, hot cocoa for the kids and, uh, you know, you, cup of coffee for myself, cup of coffee for yourself. You know, the <laughs> channel just keeps growing and, uh, 
So well, a couple caveats. I haven't published any videos in the last two weeks since it's been monetized. As a lot of you know who have YouTube accounts, I know from this account, but also just from managing other accounts and stuff. Um, obviously, you know, your views tend to spike quite a bit when you publish a new video. So, you know, we'll see where this goes. I do have a new video that I'm planning on releasing in the coming weeks. I haven't filmed it yet, so that'll be coming up. It'll be fun to see that. But definitely uh, don't quit your day job kind of money here. <laughs> yeah. You know, what do they say? It takes a few years to build up a YouTube channel. So, uh, you know, stick with it. We'll see where it goes. And, and I know and, you know, we both know that this is the 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 display ads on your youtube channel are not meant to be your no. biggest source of revenue in your business no. there's a lot and, of other again, reasons to have a youtube to put channel. it in perspective i have uh, i went back and looked and i thought i'd share i have generated 3 leads at my agency 201 creative who listed youtube in the last month wow okay and well, that's huge you know one of them has already signed up to be a monthly client at a you know multiple f uh, four figure a month um, yeah uh, amount. So again, just a reminder: like these things can serve multiple purposes, and the weekend growth brand in general is about so much more. But that's a good reminder for everyone: like if you're going to build a YouTube channel and kind of connect it to a website, connect it to an email newsletter, connect it, and you can kind of bring them all together. It can be more than one metric that helps you evaluate its success, right? But certainly, if you're just looking at the dollars earned by ads in the last couple of weeks, you probably wouldn't run out and start a YouTube channel on these on these uh, on these numbers. Yeah, but uh, kudos to you. You said you were going to share your numbers. You did share your numbers, <laughs> so thank you for being open uh, with that. Um, and I, I I think it's good, like you said, for other people hearing that if if you're gonna go big on YouTube. Um, I think very few channels uh, make all their money from display ads. Um, or even the majority very, of their money. Yeah. Right. There's there's very few brands like a Mr. Beast that could have, you know, make millions from just display ads. Of course, now he's building a bigger brand as well. You know, I think it's smart to have a bigger business model and brand behind the channel. So You're exactly right. And hopefully if you... Maybe didn't have that cemented in. You'll you'll have my eleven dollar. You have my donut money <laughs> burned into your memory now. <laughs> there you go. Exactly right. Okay, let's move on to our weird niche sites. We each have a weird niche site that we found here, and uh, mine. Well, maybe I'll just uh, you know go ahead and share what it is. Uh, mine is next episode. Dot net. Now, be sure you put a dash in there. It's next dash episode uh, dot net. And, uh, you know, they couldn't get the dot com even with the dash in there, I guess. Um, but, uh, okay, next episode dot net. Now, it's a place where you can keep track of the TV shows and movies that you watch, oh. right? So you you can pick from a bu bunch in the sidelines here. Let's, let's pick The Mandalorian because maybe that – could tie in with your weird niche site here a little bit. Um, you know, if, if you come on here, it gives all the show information. And uh, where does it show? Well, it gives a guide. You know, you can see all the dates that these were published, but you can actually follow and track somehow, somewhere. Um, you can see when the next episodes are, right? So if you follow The Mandalorian, it will say, okay, on this date is when the new ones are going to be published. Mm. And you can always be on top of your favorite shows, knowing exactly when and where they're going to be released. And uh, I think there's uh, a bit more that you – okay, well, if you join it, let's see. Okay, you can get your name and email. And then they've got an app here uh, as well. So uh, it's kind of like a mini – IMDB in a way as well, right? Because you've got, you know, the cast yeah. of everybody here and uh, they've got information on everybody, um, you know, what other shows they're known for. Uh, and so there is a lot of information in their database, but the, the sort of special thing is that, hey, it allows you to add it to your watch list, right? Boom. And then track when all the next episodes are and when they're coming out. And I assume if you have the app, it will notify you, hey, it's coming up, coming out tomorrow. Don't miss it. Uh, that sort of thing. So what kind of uh, you know, money is it making here? Well, I, I don't know, <laughs> but I do know that it is getting, I'm gonna have to look at my notes. I didn't pull up Ahrefs, uh, 151,000 organic visitors 
from um, from Google, and I do need to open this up because it's got such a good graph. Uh, if we go to nextepisode.net, and now I'll share my screen with the Ahrefs, uh, you can see that it got <laughs> absolutely slaughtered uh, in the helpful content update. Right. So as you alluded to in the beginning, this you know website got hit hard with the helpful content update. You know, so you would think, oh, that's, you know, that's good night for this business. But if we go over to, um, I mean, for those, to for those watching, it was nearing a million estimated a million organic traffic per month. And it's down to well below 200,000 now. <laughs> so exactly. when Spencer says slaughtered, he means like 85% of the content or 85% yeah, of the traffic from organic search. Just, yeah, absolutely gone. Uh, and so, but if we go over to similar web, they of course show traffic from all sources and you can see the graph here that it is getting about 3 million, uh, visitors a month wow. in January's 2.75 million visitors per month. So wow. massive website. Um, and a lot of this traffic is direct. So 72% is from direct sources. Only about 20% is actually, uh, organic. And, uh, so, um, it's, it's, and of course their top competitors are, you know, like IMDB. And, uh, so a, a good website that is doing, you know, I, again, I don't know how much money they're making, but they're getting a ton of traffic and doing pretty well. Well, again, you know, uh, kind of teased it earlier, but like, there's been a lot of people talking about the solution to the HCU is make sure you have a lot of direct, direct traffic, right? Like that shows you're a brand that people find helpful. Well, here's a website that has a lot of direct traffic and didn't just get hit by the helpful content update, got obliterated by it. Now, I did look it up. This website was first launched on October 1st, 2005, and it looks like it's using the same theme and design as the day hmm. it was launched. Yeah. So... <laughs> Um, but, but again, <clears throat> going back to it, we saw Cyrus's study show, uh, you know, ad units, number of ad units, location of ad units is a big detractor in these recent updates. I think that, the, uh, there's, I only saw like one ad per page, basically. It was a pretty subtle ad. I would say they could probably increase the amount of ads they have on here. So interesting. Yeah, absolutely. There wasn't very many ads and, and not even on all the pages. Um, they do have a premium option, yeah. um, with a free trial which I don't know exactly what it does. I mean, it, many, many additional, additional features, features. <laughs> <laughs> with cool tweaks and tools, right? Uh, that makes me want to sign up. It's so specific. Uh, premium keeps getting better with features added all the time. Clean, no ads experience, uh, 30 day free trial. So, so basically not only what do you is get cool it? features, but you continue to get more cool features and they continue to tweak them. Yes. Um, so, so they're cool. You know, the, the sales copy is not great on their, uh, their premium. I don't know exactly what it would be, but, uh, so I'm guessing there's not a lot of premium subscribers, but still a very interesting, uh, business and weird niche website. Nonetheless, they said at the top, uh, uh, try free for 30 days, less than a coffee a month. If you continue after, and, uh, on my budget, that would have to say less than a donut a month. If you continue less after. than a donut a month, That's there you go. Hey, afford. you know, with all the money you're making on YouTube, you could get a free premium subscription here to <laughs> next episode. Done. <laughs> Uh, well, with their traffic levels, though, going all the way back, even with their minimal ad placement and their poor uh, premium sales page copy, they're probably still doing okay in terms of revenue. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a pretty heavily a a updated website, but nonetheless, it's definitely earning some money. Yeah. No, I think so. But uh, yeah, a lot of opportunity as well. <laughs> well, my weird niche looks pretty similar in terms of the way the website comes across as yours does. <laughs> should uh -huh. I, uh, should I jump Let's in now? Do it. Yep. Go ahead. So my website is Jedi temple archives.com. <laughs> it's an ode to star Wars. My daughter has got the star Wars bug and, uh, is full on in star Wars mode. So we talk about star Wars a lot and I thought there's gotta be some weird star Wars niches out there. Um, this is one of them. Um, so in essence, this is, it's basically like a comprehensive resource that's dedicated to not just Star Wars, 
again, listen, listen to, to, to what we talk about, but Star Wars toys and collectibles. So it's like a niche of a niche, right? And um, I mean, it is like they, they, there are multiple articles being published every single day on this. And it's just all about, hey, here's the latest toy that got released. And obviously, it's, uh, I got a collectible bend to it. I don't collect these kind of things. Um, but, uh, but, but there's like a collectible twist to it. So it's like, you know, obviously probably toys that are like going to resale for hire or there's a good deal on or something like that. Um, you're poking around there. You're looking yeah. at, you found something not even related to toys. It looks like. Well, it started out as toy reviews. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I don't know. It looks like almost some sort of discussion forum as well. I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh, it's just, they had comments on their, their review. That's what it okay. was. Yeah. Well, it's um it it's it's uh it it's been around for a while you can tell uh in terms of the metrics uh in terms of like what we all like to see a uh, dr forty three so you know nothing to sneeze at but but nothing um nothing crazy uh just over thirteen thousand keywords um only just over three thousand uh monthly organic searches so it's it's been on yeah. the down there you go you can see it there it's been on the downturn. Um, certainly since, uh, the, the, the usual barrage of updates we're we're kind of used to looking at, um, uh, it does have ads on the site. They're kind of like the last site we looked at They're They're not over overly prominent. Um, it does have affiliate links though, to a lot of those toys that they talk about. Uh, okay, I saw, I saw share sale links. I would imagine maybe some Amazon links when applicable. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, I, I was telling you before we got started, I don't know if you had time to bring this up on similar web, but I, I do yeah. think this looks like a site that doesn't just live off of organic traffic, but probably does decent on direct traffic. Yep. So here we got similar web. Um, it's showing that, you know, overall it's like 80, 70 to 85,000, uh, visitors total a month and uh, direct traffic is, you know, 60% of that. Right. So. Yeah, they it have their organic search. Of... Yeah, a lot higher than three thousand a month, but but still um, a small portion of uh, compared to the direct traffic. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, again, we talk about it—a <clears throat> niche of a niche. Um, I would imagine that if the majority of their traffic is coming from direct traffic, that these are people who are coming here to find out about the latest Star Wars toys and collectibles. They're probably making purchases from this website. They're probably generating decent affiliate commissions. Um, I don't know how much all these things are, are priced, but I imagine some of them are, are, are fairly expensive. Certainly maybe some of the more higher end ones. So I'm, um, I'm stretching a bit, but I again, think we have a site here that is out of date, uh, not doing great in search, but still probably very, you know, making a very, uh, good little side hustle kind of income. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, right? I'm just looking at one of the posts here, the vintage collection, Luke Skywalker, Jedi Academy, $12 and 60 cents on Amazon. Like that's the whole post. It's like, he's just literally saying, here, go buy this on Amazon. It's, it's this price, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. that literally is it. Um, I assumed there would be <laughs> some other details, but there's not, uh, you can just click on his affiliate link. Yep. And you can go buy it on Amazon and I guess he must be doing, I mean, this was published yesterday or no, two days ago. And, um, so he must, I mean, he's still active. He's doing it. It must be working. To I mean, some there's degree. three or four posts a day. I saw, I mean, I didn't go yeah. back very far, but there's like three or four posts a day on it. So very interesting. So he's getting enough direct traffic, um, that, Hey, it's worth it. He'll just keep publishing, go get it on Amazon and, uh, make a little bit of money. So between display ads and affiliate revenue, you know, he's yeah, making probably a couple thousand bucks a month, right? I mean, again, this is one of those things where I'm 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 totally guessing here, but it's probably a guy who you know is obsessed with uh, Star Wars collectibles and toys, and he just he's already checking these things anyways, and he just made a website about it, and now all he has to do is one extra step to publish. Like, oh, cool, I just found this newest Star Wars collectible. Bam! I'll just put a yeah. post up, throw my affiliate link up, you know, I mean, it has that feeling, but it obviously gets what 90,000 people coming here a month to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Now this one's, uh, this one's fun because it's, you know, it's kind of like, a take, taking a, a fan base, right. Of star Wars. And, uh, this is mostly toys. It seems like, right. And kind of sort of the niche of the niche. Um, and then certainly people that are big enough fans that they're co collecting, uh, the toys, you know, we've seen that of course, with uh, Inside the Magic, with Disney, right? You can take something that people are just really passionate about and uh, create 
it's not even necessarily just a fan website. It's more like this one uh, seems to be mostly about, you know, toy reviews and that sort of thing. But there's so many things out there that people are just hugely Remember, passionate about. Who do we have on with. bachelor Steve or something? Uh, reality Steve reality was a, Steve. uh, yeah, was, yes, <laughs> was a weird niche site that <laughs> talks about site? the bachelor. Uh -huh. Right. There you go. So yeah, another great example of like, I mean, he didn't make up the bachelor. He didn't have to come up with a hit product. He just came up with a, took advantage of a fan base and found yep. a specialty in it. And then, you know, a unique built an audience. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there's so many ways uh, that people could do that out there. So hopefully that, you know, sparks some ideas for people. Um, good find. You keep finding these old websites, you know, same, you know, old looking uh, websites at least. And uh, they're always uh, fun, to, fun to talk about. So many things out there. Uh, here we are a year doing the, the news episode essentially. And uh, we are, we have not yet run out of weird niche websites. No, no, but um, I have been, uh, it's, it's fallen on me the last couple of weeks. So our, our, our listener base has, uh, has been coming up drive late. <laughs> there you go me. guys G give jared some help out there send him some big tips. of a cry for help as i can make <laughs> yeah a hotline 1-800 weird niche you know uh <laughs> see if you can lock that google uh that google lock, voice lock number down, down before we go live that's right and uh give us give us a tip so all right everyone thank you so much for listening uh lots in the news going on of course that uh you know we we read all the headlines we're gonna have a lot more next week for you so stick around for that uh and then um niche pursuits community is coming on monday so head on over to community.nichepursuits.com and uh jared of course thank you so much for joining us being open with your numbers on youtube sharing your weird niche site and of course your perspectives as well of course have a great weekend we'll see you guys same place same time next week thanks everyone Thanks for joining us today on the podcast. Just a final reminder that it was brought to you by Search Intelligence. And if you're looking for link building PR campaigns for your website, just head over to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them today. Cheers. Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening to the Niche Pursuits podcast. I just wanted to remind you that if you are ready to start building smarter, faster, and easier internal links, you should check out Link Whisper. You can get $15 off Link Whisper when you use the coupon code PODCAST at checkout. Head over to linkwhisper.com and use the code PODCAST in order to save $15. Thanks again for listening.